probably. The church is officially closed. The bishop asked for that, and so that's, I've complied. But I gotta tell you, I was reluctant in that. It took me a while to come to terms with it, but I got to thinking that if I just stubbornly kept it open, said everybody come in and we hug and we touch and we do all this other stuff, and then somebody got sick, that would devastate me. So I like this, a little social distancing. I like this, we're here, we can worship, it's abbreviated, we'll go on home. I think next week we'll do the same thing. After that, we'll have to make some decisions. I don't see how any of this can be sustained for a very long time. But that's just me. I've got a couple of things I wanted to read, but the first thing I found, I got up at 3 o'clock this morning. If you think this stuff doesn't bother me, you'd be wrong. 3 o'clock this morning, I woke up. And it's on my heart and my mind. And I was led to Ecclesiastics. Chapter 3, verse 5. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. I got to thinking about that. One of the things I like is somebody that wants to be hugged, I want to hug them. Somebody that wants to shake, I want to shake. If they don't, I'm okay with it. But I personally like it. But in these times, we can't do what we like. We have to do what we have to do. And as the pastor, I have to lead by example. So until we kind of get an okay, I won't be hugging, I won't be shaking hands. I'll be waving, hey, across the room. It's not because I don't love you, but it's because I do love you. It says here, Matthew 6, uh, 26, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We shouldn't be anxious. But we also should have courage. This is Philippians 4.13. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are enduring, as, as, th as, all, as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice that your participation in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when the glory is revealed. So we're to have courage. Proverbs 24, 5. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Those are three scriptures. And they lead up to what today's message is. I thought it was really important that we still have a message coming from the pulpit of St. John's and that we still can share with others. We don't have the ability to live stream, but we do have the, the ability to share. I'm going to talk about the Great Commission. You may want to turn to Matthew 28, 16 through 20. This is a really familiar passage. It is basically taken for granted when we read it, when we talk about it. It's something that we've heard. We've probably heard every sermon you can have preached on this. This is one of those passages that just preachers like to preach on. It's kind of like John 3.16. There are some that are so familiar that you know them almost by heart. Sometimes we dismiss things when we believe we've heard everything you can hear about something. But you know, with God's word, that's always a mistake. We are told in Revelation 2, 4, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Who is the first love and who forsake what? This was one of the warnings that Christ gave to the churches. I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. This was because people had dis been dismissal dismissive of God's word. This is Christ's condemnation of a good church. It was an orthodox church. It was a believing church. But it was a church who left the first things of Christ. It's a church that ignored the Great Commission. So I kind of got to wondering, what had they forgotten and what have we forgotten? Here are the things you loved at first when you first believed. 
For some of you, it was so long ago that you may not remember the joy that you had. I think there's no greater joy than seeing a person that's a little older come to know Christ and realize what that means to their life. You've seen it. The joy, the enthusiasm, the willingness to serve, want to tell everybody, want to praise, want to shout. And then there's us. <laughs> you were on fire for Christ at one time. Some of you still are. I'm not condemning you. I'm just reading what God says. He had this against that church. They had forgotten their first love. You love the power of the gospel to change lives. You were amazed at the power of God. With his sending his only son to live a life you could never live and dying a death that you could never die. You loved obedience to the Great Commission. You seen it, you heard it, and you felt it, and you wanted to share it with the entire world. No matter how big or small our churches may be, we must never abandon our first love. I think these hurt more than they help. Now, nah. these last words given by Christ in the Great Commission, these last words as he ascended into heaven, these last words are our first words for our call to action in the body of Christ. His last words are our first words. They don't end with his ascension. They begin. The 11 disciples were called to go to that mountain and they proceeded to Galilee. And when they saw Jesus, they worshiped him. But some were doubtful. Now these were the disciples, these were the faithful. But some were doubtful. They'd seen him raise the dead, they'd seen him perform many miracles that were never even written in the Bible. They saw him go from dead to alive. But some were doubtful. Jesus came up and spoke to them. And he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Simple, right? We've all heard it. I can close and we can go home. <laughs> Not. Most of our jobs, most of our lives, is what we call the same old, same old. How you doing today, Bob? Ah, same old, same old. What'd you do today? Same old, same old. What you gonna do tomorrow? Same old, same old that I didn't get finished today. And you know, there are things that are best left alone when they've proven to be successful. When it comes to the Word of God, it's like that. We're best to leave it alone. We cannot and we must not reinvent God's Word. Many false prophets do that. Many false prophets tried that 2,000 years ago. There are places in the scripture that seem like it's the same old, same old, and some try to add a little pizzazz to it. But our attitude shouldn't be, should be, let's not get fancy. Just give me the faithfulness of the word. There's a timeless message in the Bible. It transcends all cultures, times, from the last words of Christ as he went into heaven to the prophets of the Old Testament to the end of Revelation. There's a timeless scene in it all. Some have turned telling the good news into a full theater productions. You've seen them? Bands, lights, marvelous things. They got lightning, lighting, sound, sway. Seems to be a spiritual revival in your soul. I've got to confess, I've felt that. I've been to those. I've been there when you're caught up. 
The Holy Spirit must be working. It's just filling me. But then you leave there. You're gone a little bit. And then you say, was that the Holy Spirit? Or is that the theater? Was that the light? Was that the people? Was that, what was that that was filling me? Did I get involved in it because it felt good? Or did I get involved in it because God was calling me? I think only the true word of God can sustain us. If you walk away from that and you're not sustained by it for very long, that wasn't God's true word sustaining you. It was theater. It was performance. When we come to this passage in Matthew, this is the great commission of Jesus Christ. We've heard it, read it, spoke it. Is it still your passion, though? Is it still, or is it the lights and sounds of other Gospels? The text is pretty plain. You don't get much plainer than that. I just read it to you, what Jesus said. He told us what to do, how to do it, when to do it. We serve a God who's always, though, rewriting, reviving, correction, correcting, and establishing his church in us. He's reviving us. There's times that I am dead spiritually. God has to put me on the Holy Spirit CPR list. You ever give CPR? It's an interesting thing to do. You do chest compressions, get the blood going. You do breath, get the oxygen, the oxygen to the brain, get it going. You do many things trying to keep somebody alive. You can give them shocks to shock things. Off. Sometimes God has to do that with us. He breathed life into us to begin with. He has to breathe life into us continually or we'll die. Sometimes spiritually it's the same thing. He has to shock you. One of my shocks was this morning, 3 o'clock when I turned to Ecclesiastics because I was really dreading coming to this church that I love, having very few people here, more, more fewer than normal, and not being able to express my love and care the way I like doing it. It concerned me. But that's not about God. That was all about me. God said, Bob, there's a time for it and a time not for it. This ain't the time for it. So we got to listen to God's word. We keep the main thing the main thing, and that's God's word. We're concerned a great thing, a great lot about many things. We've experienced it here. Buying and selling a property. It's always a contentious thing. Renovating the sanctuary. Always, always a, oh, yes. Um, what color paint for the walls? You know, I look through the scriptures, and I don't find that up there anywhere in the Great Commission. Not a place. How about committee meetings? They're important. How about pastors sometimes worrying about their position in the community? Do I lead a big church? Jackie asked me the other night if I was going to a meeting. I says, I don't know what meeting you're talking about. Well, it seemed that the sheriff had called together some of the churches to talk whatever the sheriff wanted to talk about. And I told her, I wasn't called. I wasn't asked. You know, there's real advantages to being a small church. People will overlook you. And you know how I feel about meetings. Overlook me all day long. Have they been overlooking you? They sent you a letter. Oh, yeah. They wanted me to join the sheriff's association and pay them 25 bucks. But some pastors worry about that. That's a social standing. One of the first questions I get asked, and I hear asked, but I never try to ask, well, how big is your church? How many do you serve? How many people do you have? Like, what's that got to do with anything with any pastor serving? But I get asked it all the time when we're at conference and whatnot. I'm going to say, well, how big is St. John's? Sometimes I want to just say, boy, man, it's a 10-story building that overtakes 50 acres, you know? We can't even keep all the sheep in there. Then I figure that's just Bob being Bob, and God wouldn't like that. So I just go, we're small, but we're loving. This passage teaches us, though, that we have to keep the main things main, this mission. Number one, 
The mission of the church is grounded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'll repeat that one because it's an important thing. The mission of the church is grounded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, when they saw him, they saw the resurrected and living Savior who directed them to this mountain. And he gave them the first principle of the mission. This mission was not given prior to his death. He didn't give this on the road to Judea. He didn't do this when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't do this when he was in the upper room. He did this as the last thing that he did. His whole ministry had been teaching the disciples, the apostles, us how to live. How to live. We're told we will be known as his disciples as we love one another. We're to live in love. That's what he told us. But now Jesus changes it. Now he's telling us what to do. Here's how you live. You love one another. Now here's what you're going to do because of that love. That comes after his death and resurrection. This came after he died. Show me any church which calls itself Christian and grounds its mission in any fact other than the mission of the resurrected Christ, and I will show you a flawed church. Didn't mean it's a lost church, it just means it's a flawed church. It's one of those that Christ will speak to. Here's what I have against you. You've lost compassion for your first love. Our mission is grounded in the historical fact of the resurrection of Christ. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is uh, vain and your faith is also vain. If Christ is not risen, you're not believing in a living Savior. Christ is alive today. That's why we're saved. I raise it from being grounded in a risen Savior is directing his people to continue preaching that today. The division in the church today is no different than it's always been. We've had divisions. Anytime you have human beings, you're going to have divisions. You're going to have disagreements. You're going to have people that think this and think that. But God cut all that to the chase. We are to worship the resurrected Christ. Sometimes we get a mission that is religious in nature. We are giving a supernatural mission. We don't have a regular mission. It's supernatural. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's not a normal thing that happens. That is something that God did. Number two, the mission of the church arose out of worship. And we must always be centered on worship. As I was reading this, studying this, thinking about the words that I should say, I understood why it was important for me to be standing here today. Few ears hearing. Hopefully it's recording. We'll be able to put it out to anybody that wants it. I've told you before, I've shared with you before. We're not the only ears that hear the message that God sends to us. It's important that we do that. But it almost uh, always has to be centered on worship. It says, Then the eleven uh, disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. They worshipped him. They seen the resurrected Lord, and they worshipped him. The mo new mission of the church was given in worship. And it is still that way today. Those that are sitting here today, you made a decision to come. I'm not critical on anybody that didn't make that decision. I think it's wise, probably. But your decision was that worship was greater than fear. Amen? Amen. 
Worship is greater than fear. The world can do many things, but it will not stop me from worshiping God. We're told in Hebrews not to forsake the assembling of ourselves as some have done. Really good reasons not to assemble right now, I think. Our very existence was born in worship and maintained in worship. It's advanced in worship. That's where we're resuscitated by God. That's where our cold hearts are torn warm, where our shallow breath is given deeper, where our faltering thoughts are more focused. Talking this morning about if someone feels closer to God by coming to the altar and praying. I've been here by myself in this church at that altar praying by myself. Actually hoping that no one would walk in because that was a private time for me and God. Now I could pray anywhere. I could have sat in my truck and prayed. But on the days that I need to, I feel closer and I understand that need. That's the reason I'm here. Everyone makes this decision, I made mine. You're not a better Christian for being here. Don't pat yourself on the back. You're not a worse Christian for not being here. Don't take the guilt. We need to use common sense, and we do need to avoid unnecessary contact. I think the risks, from what I understand, are so small as to be almost insignificant. But again, if I made a call and that insignificant risk happened and one of you were extremely sick or died from it, that would devastate my life. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be stubborn trying to honor God. I want to be faithful in honoring God. We are to lead people to God. That's the next point in the Great Commission. We are to lead people to Christ. Anywhere, everywhere. But we encourage them back to the local church. The public worship of God, people of God, is a faith-building time that can't be duplicated anywhere else. You cannot duplicate what goes on in every Christian church in some big theme, some big area where the music's loud, the vibrations are good, the swaying's nice. That's not what we want. We want you to hear the word of God from the word of God. John Piper, the prominent Baptist pastor from Minneapolis, stated, uh, states it very well. The fuel for the worldwide mission is worship. That's it. The fuel for the worldwide mission is worship. Thus, we must make our services a reenactment of the gospel. We must ground our services in the reality of Christ with us, a supernatural event, not a humanly contrived performance and showmanship. Edmund Clowey of Westminster Seminary proclaimed that worship itself is evangelistic in nature. The fact that men and women gather together because they believe the risen Savior is there. We sing to him. We pray to him. We interpret his message for our own today as a sign of our faith. These are two great men of God that had that to say about worship. It's important. I pray our worship at St. John's lift up many for Jesus. Many may be drawn to him. Number three, the mission of the church is advanced even in the midst of doubters. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. It's necessary that you see while they worship, there was doubts in some of their hearts. Some doubted even when they saw him. They just couldn't understand it. How much more do we doubt today? There has and always will be a church filled with wheat and tares, believers and doubters. I hope the word is it's told over and over again that the doubters become believers.
if you're looking for the perfect church, it's not on earth yet. But this will not stop the power of the gospel. Sadly, some of the biggest doubters are in the pulpits today. They're on TV today, on the radio today. I was in a bookstore the other day and they're on book racks everywhere today. If you're not preaching the absolute gospel of Jesus Christ, you're a doubter. And I didn't see where that doubting unsaved to disciples. I didn't see where having doubts cause you to lose your salvation. What's Christ say about faith? We need how much of it? Well, even a doubter probably has that much they can work up. <laughs> Some in the pulpits, they cloak themselves in the robes of authority, vestments of power, not the humble servants. When I first, come on, Methodist pastor, it's a whole new world for me. Went to my first general conference, and I come home and told Jackie. She said something, how to go or something. I said, I think I was among peacocks. She said, what? I said, there was just line after line, marching with their robes on, their chevrons going, their vestments showing. They were walking in holy possession. What were you doing? Setting up in the third balcony, hiding. <laughs> I want to be seen here. I want to be heard here. I don't care about being heard at General Conference. Jackie said, well, I can make you some of that. I said, I don't want it. I've got one, I've got one robe. If somebody wants to get married and they want me in a robe, I can put it on. I got another one if somebody wants to be baptized with me in a robe. It's one of my kids' high school graduation robes. I use it. I'm a two-robe guy. When I die, they'll both really be in good shape. If you had let me, I'd be up here in shorts and tennis shoes. But I'm not going to push it right now. <laughs> Clothing does not make your power, does not show your love, does not give you your authority. The Word of God does that. Others, I thought I was going to leave you all alone, didn't you? Others in the pews have been in the pews so long they can't see anything but the building. These buildings we call churches. But they don't see it as churches. They see it as their church, my church, even our church. But they don't see it as the church of Jesus Christ. Ivy Bluff was a bit like that. That was my home church. And a maniac burned it to the ground. We had carvings. We had rich heritage. My whole family, from my grand great grandmother, who was a Civil War widow, had been brought up in that church, born in that church, married in that church, baptized in that church. My whole family had been there. That was the history I didn't learn until I moved back to Tennessee and started going there. They burned down my church. Now they got one bigger, better, newer. But there's still some that were so devastated they can't go to the newer, bigger, and better because their church was destroyed. The building was. The church is still there. We are the church. Christ is the church. Doubters can't stop the mission of the church. Number four. The mission of the church is centered on the ruling and reigning of Christ. What's Christ tell us? Verse 6, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Well, who gave this authority? Father God gave him that authority. Only God can give that authority. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that were on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. For it pleased the Father... Uh, 
then in him all the fullness should uh, dwell well. Colossians uh, 1.19. Today the church is serving the Lord who is absolute sovereign over viruses, over the terrorists, over the enemy, over politicians, over atheists, over haters, over all the things that are destroying our church. God has absolute authority. We shouldn't be afraid. We should preach boldly. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, his life, death, and resurrection is his royal decree. It's the plan of the ages. God himself came down as part of humanity in Christ. The church will always be successful. The church will be here until God himself, or Jesus, takes the church out. Now, I know we can get into that pre, post, mid, and post thing. I'm, I'm really in favor of the pre getting taken out. But we'll be taken out when he decides to take us out. Then and only then will the church be removed. Not until that moment. The bishop can't close down the churches. The state can't close down the churches. The mission of the church, number five, is outward moving by design. It's not inward dwelling, verse 19. Therefore, go. Therefore, go. We see this outward nature, this mandate. Go, therefore. His authority leads us. We fulfill the promises of the Old Testament. We're told to go and make disciples. Part of that's happening right now as we speak. You are showing your discipleness. You're showing your love. We're recording this in the hope that other people can be encouraged. We have neither the people nor the resources to go into all the world. But that's the big reason I felt mandatory to lead to worship here and not sitting in a chair somewhere and just given this scripture. I think if I'm by myself, it's just as important that it come from St. John's. We are the church. Our job is to go and tell. God will direct the ones that need to hear the message. God will send the Holy Spirit to that person. We're told to go and liberate the captives. Heal the brokenhearted, release men and women and entire nations from bondage of Satan, the consequences of sin. And that by the power of God's holy word, we're giving that to a lost world. This command is a corporate command. It's not an individual command. There's no one individual who can do it all. The church as a whole must go. But the church is made up of people, individuals. Church is made up of some people that can't go physically, can't go financially, can't go obligation-wise. They can't go, but the obligation is to go, but it's a corporate thing. We need to do what we can to reach out to as many as we can. This was taken literally and personally by the disciples. Those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. They physically went everywhere in the then known world. To be a Christian is to be personally committed to fulfilling the Great Commission, the first love that we had when we come to Christ. Making disciples, first in your own home, then in your community, when we come in contact with others, through your participation with others, we make disciples of all nations, Isaiah 49. It is, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. It was too small a thing for salvation to be only for Israel. It made salvation possible for the Gentiles. In case you weren't keeping score, that's us. We are to make it available to all the ends of the earth. 
Christianity, as Paul showed in his defense before the governor Felix in Acts 26, is not a sect, but a fulfillment of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and thus the only legitimate herd of faith of the patriarchs, and we are not designed and commanded to keep our church closed to others. We're to open up our church. I can tell you stories about churches that have opened themselves up to the community, and there's a lot of members, good members, loving members, faithful members, that would get mad and not come back to that church because I don't want those people in my church. Now, would that really be a Christian attitude? No. I've seen it happen, though. It's just outward going. This spinning away from our mustard seed of faith to a number that no man can count. That's how much that mustard seed of faith can bring. We can bring that many into God's kingdom. <laughs> Church is now and always reaching outward, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and of the Holy Spirit's teaching them. So our job is also to teach, to train. can be church planning. I would love to see the time that St. John's could plant a church. It's planting neighbors, groups. I was told this morning about a Bible study happening in a home. I love it. I wish every one of us had Bible studies in our homes. I love it. The original churches were our homes. This is kind of a modernized thing that we've got going here with our churches. The original churches were in. Wesley was preaching out in cow pastures. They'd kick them out of the, they'd kick them out of the, the, the church the, and, and they would send them out to the cow pasture and he would draw a crowd. Some claim they can't hear me here without a microphone. Can you imagine preaching in a cow pasture? That boy had to have a set of lungs. But whether it's in Pierce County, Savannah, Georgia, North America, we support the gospel. We're to teach them. Jesus is calling for us to have a radical mission. We're to teach with a view to change the course of people's lives. That's what Christ did. When Christ saved me, he changed my life. When he saved you, he changed your life. We are to teach that with the goal of Christ changing people's lives. A lot of people don't want change. But to preach and teach it, whether they want it or not, if they obey, that's great. But we don't quit preaching it because there's some people say, well, we don't want to hear that. And stay away. We're told, Paul again, for I've not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God, Acts 27. So we proclaim the whole Acts whole whole counsel of God I lost my thought and this goes until the day that we're removed and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age that closes out the great commission and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age we're told to worship the resurrected Christ we're told that we have got to make disciples, teach, go, and Christ's power is with us. We're told that we're to be faithful to this well-known, well-preached on, often heard passage. That has to be our first love, fulfilling the last words of Christ as the first words of our Christian life. It's a continuation. There's not a break. Christ leaving and us starting. There's no break. His words flowed with ours. It just flowed. It's a natural, just a natural thing. It's timeless. It's seamless. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless the reading of your word today, the message that was given. I pray, Father, that you take my imperfections, my stumblings, and just tune them out to those that are hearing and listening. And let them hear what your word says, Father. Father, I pray that you'll just give us strength and courage as we go about this week. Let us continue to just faithfully proclaim you everywhere we can. 
Father, we pray again for America, for this virus, for this time of uncertainty, for our economy. We pray for all the, the doomsayers, Father. We pray that you'll just lift us up. You'll open that door. You'll show us the way, Father, that we can come back and be a stronger, more Christian nation than we were to begin with. Let this trial strengthen us. Let it make us like steel in fire. Let it harden us, Father, to the goal, to your great commission, to what we should do. And Father, I pray for the day soon that we open these sanctuary back up for our full, loving worship. And I pray that you just bring so many people in that the pews overflow. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name, his holy and mighty name. I wouldn't feel right if we didn't play, have at least one song. Has there anybody got a song that we could all sing easily? What do you think, Kat? I know I didn't prove it. Huh? Well, let's sing that. Let's sing that. You want to play or want to just go acapella?